In this part three of wakefulness and sleep, I'm going to talk about the function of sleep and some of the uh, theories of why we sleep or what this function is. And I'm going to get as far through the sleep disorders as I can today. There certainly appears to be a function and a reason for sleeping. Um, and it appears that it helps us with energy conservation uh, in general. Uh, so that we're conserving energy when we're um, not needing to use energy. Uh, and we see that animals vary on their need for, for how much sleep they need. And it really depends on how vulnerable are they. So I've stolen this picture from somewhere of the lions sleeping. Those really large predatory animals, they we can often see them sleeping a large portion of the day. We also see... Um, animals that have good places to hide, that they sleep quite a bit more than these animals that are particularly vulnerable. So um, the sheep, the cow, the horse, they all sleep uh, very little because they are large. They're really prey animals and they're very vulnerable when they're sleeping. And I told you I was going to promote sleep as much as I possibly can. It really is important for our memory. And it looks like REM is important for our non-declarative memory. And I've, uh, I've said this a couple of times, but it's a really great place here because pretty soon we will talk about learning and memory. Um, but I also sort of made a big deal on the uh, first exam with that the hippocampus is involved in laying down new explicit memories or declarative memories. So these are these are memories that we can declare. And when we say they, they are explicit, we are aware of the memory, but we also have non-declarative memories. Um, or this includes procedural memory, and I talked about the basal ganglia being particularly important for this kind of memory. We can think of it as muscle memory sometimes, but there's also this, this kind of finding patterns in um, in things that we're not aware of exactly how we understood that pattern. And so this was a non-declarative visual discrimination task. And they um, trained people on the task and then they either uh, gave them no nap, they gave them a nap where they got slow wave sleep only, and or they gave them a nap where they got slow wave sleep and REM sleep. And what they found was that with uh, no nap, they actually do worse than um, at, the, at the end of the first session, then the sec second session when they're being tested, they do worse. Uh, whether this is some kind of interference or that we need to sleep is not completely clear. With slow wave sleep only, they do about the same in the second session as they did in the first session. Okay, if they're given a nap where they have slow wave sleep and they're allowed to go into REM, we see that they do better on the task, this non-declarative uh, visual discrimination task after the nap that includes REM sleep. Declarative memories are also consolidated during sleep. So this is a study where they looked at either a declarative learning task where people were learning lists of um, paired words and a non-declarative learning task where it was a mirror tracing. So if you've seen those mirror tracings, it'll be something like um, a star or whatever, and, but I'm looking in a mirror and, and tracing that way. And that's at first when you're looking in the mirror, just like uh, when you're um, shaving or doing anything, we learn to do that by looking in a mirror. But usually when we're drawing a star or something, we're looking down at the paper and everything in the mirror is reversed, right? So at first, when you start to do this task, it's very difficult. But as you practice a few times, it gets easier and easier. And that's, again, one of those implicit or non-declarative uh, kinds of tasks. In this study, they gave people a nap where they were allowed to go into slow wave sleep. OK, and on the, I'm going to start with the figure on the far right, that non-declarative learning task, similar to what we saw in the um, visual discrimination task on the last slide, they had no help from uh, there was no improvement uh, whether they were awake or or whether they got to have this nap with slow wave sleep it doesn't appear to help slow wave sleep does not appear to help non-declarative memory but this uh, nap with slow wave sleep uh, they did find some help for the learning the list of uh, paired words for the declarative learning task so it looks like it's during slow wave sleep that our 
um, explicit declarative movie um, memories are being consolidated. Sleep helps our memory and problem solving in other ways as well. As we saw before, I'm going to jump to the bottom, but it appears that there's a correlation uh, between sleep spindles uh, in stage two and um, nonverbal IQ. Uh, so it looks like we're doing some processing while we're sleeping that has to do with our um, learning ability. Uh, we have a reanalysis of memories where that helps us with our problem solving. Some people have an aha moment while they're sleeping. I'll go ahead and give my story of I was I am probably one of the worst computer programmers in the world. I don't like doing it. It's like pulling teeth. And I had to do a lot of programming during graduate school. And my strategy, this is not a strategy for someone who wants to move forward quickly, obviously, but every once in a while I would just get frustrated and um tired of doing what I was doing and I'd go home and I'd take a nap and unfortunately I was reinforced just a few times just enough times for me to believe that I should be napping whenever I really run into a problem when, I'm, when I was trying to figure out my computer programs that is actually not a very good strategy but but I did a couple of times have these aha moments and thought oh I think sleeping is helping me uh, but people do have aha moments uh, when they're sleeping so um, one of the things sometimes people ask me how to study for my tests and um, or how they should prepare and and every once in a while I do think to to tell them well one good one good idea is to keep up with the work and the material as we move along and then not cram the night before so that you can uh, get a good night's sleep and especially for that kind of creative thinking that you're um, going to want to be able to do for the extra credit questions uh, but just even bringing back uh, memories it's very it's a very good idea to um, read right before you go to sleep, something that you really want to learn. One of the things I used to do when I was storytelling is I would tell my story to myself right before I went to sleep in order to lay that down in memory. Uh, anyway, so uh, uh, we also see recordings from the hippocampus. Uh, they have watched people while they're learning a particular task and then while they're sleeping and they see a particular pattern of activity when people are learning this uh, whatever task they gave them. And then during sleep, they saw that the hippocampus several times went through that same pattern of activity uh, more quickly than while they were awake. They went through that same pattern. It the hippocampus went through that same pattern of activity forwards and backwards. So this might another, be another reason why we see these kinds of aha moments. We're thinking about things really in different ways. Another thing that's happening during sleep is the weakening of less useful connections. So we've talked a little bit in this class, probably not enough about synaptic pruning, but one of the things we want is an efficiently working brain and we want the connections that are being used to be strengthened, but we also need those connections that are not being used to be, to be pruned away so that we can um, focus on the connections that are, that are useful. To us so we see uh, synaptic pruning or the weakening of less useful connections during sleep as well crucially sleep appears to be essential for survival one of the pieces of evidence for this is this fatal familial insomnia this is genetic so and it's very rare but what they see is um, first these people lose their sleep spindles and K complexes then they lose their slow wave sleep and they start to have only brief periods of REM sleep without the paralysis. And then, but eventually they are just not sleeping um, at all. So this results in damage to the thalamus. Uh, we see deficits in attention and memory. So similar to what we start to see, right? When we are just, when we're sleep deprived, um, that our cognitive skills are decreasing and also some uh, irritability and lack of emotional regulation. This is followed by a dreamlike confused state. And if you remember from earlier, uh, if we don't get our REM sleep, then REM appears to start um, occurring in other stages of sleep and sometimes when we're awake. So we, they look like they're sometimes dreaming while awake. Uh, loss of control of autonomic and endocrine systems, uh, increased temperature, and, um, and of course, insomnia. Typically, uh, they once they know they have this or have any clue that this might be happening to them, they're dead within 12 months. 
Similarly, in rats, so there's been a study on rats where they kept rats awake, just um, constantly awake. This is uh, Recht, Schaffen, and colleagues. They were constantly kept awake without forcing continuous exercise. So this isn't some kind of we're wearing them out. This is partly due to exercise, and they also had control rats that exercised the same amount as the experimental rats. These experimental rats that were just constantly kept awake, they um, started to look sick, they stopped grooming, they became weak and uncoordinated, they lost their ability to regulate body temperature, just like we saw with people, they began eating more, but were losing weight, and eventually they died. And when they go in and see what was the cause of death, the cause of death is still not understood. They died from lack of sleep. What specifically are the functions of REM sleep? Uh, well, if you told me that it was important for consolidating non-declarative memory, I would tell you that that is extremely important, and that's important for all the animals we can think of, right? How do we perform certain behaviors? That's an important thing to be able to remember when we need to perform that same behavior again. But some of the suggestions here, so one thing we see, the more sleep a person or an animal gets, the higher percentage of that sleep is REM sleep. And he shows us, so the figure over to the right is uh, showing through the lifespan that when we are infants, when we are very young, we're sleeping a great deal. And then a lot of that is REM sleep in the, in the pink red kind of color. And as we get older, we are sleeping less and less. And um, it's a smaller and smaller proportion of that is REM sleep. One idea that's out there that, um, that I wonder about a bit is just getting oxygen to the cornea. So the idea is, so when our eyes are open, the cornea is getting oxygen from the air around. And then as we close our eyes, it can still receive oxygen from the fluid, that aqueous humor behind it. But as we're asleep and our eyes are still, that um, fluid becomes stagnant. And so the cornea is not allowed, is not getting oxygen. So one idea is that we're having REM sleep, we're having that rapid eye movements just to get oxygen to the cornea. We might actually wonder then, well, why why are we dreaming? Why why is anything going on um, in our brains? Why are we having these intense hallucinations? Uh, but and there's also some evidence that perhaps that's not the whole answer. We do see the higher percentage of the higher amount, the larger the amount of sleep, the higher percentage of REM sleep. That looks like evidence that so the longer we have this kind of stagnant fluid and no oxygen to the cornea, the more we have to have those eye movements. But so people who take antidepressants, they tend to have less of their proportion of sleep as REM sleep, and it doesn't seem to hurt them in any way. They don't have cornea damage. If we look at biolo biological perspectives on dreaming, if you've ever, if you've taken my personality class, you know that I'm very interested in dreams. And um, I've even done in one research methods class asked some questions about dreams as I was teaching personality at the same time. And many of our personality theorists suggest that there is some, there are clues to our personality and who we are and what we're working through, some of the stuff that we're working through in our dreams. But the biological perspectives on dreaming are completely different. One is the activation synthesis hypothesis, that basically we are having this random activation from the pons and so random activation of various areas of the brain and we're just trying to synthesize that into something that makes some kind of sense. And because the prefrontal cortex is really low in activity, we do have this uh, lack of real goals and um, it's, it jumps around. We can be in one place and then a different place. So there's the synthesis is kind of what the best, the best that we can do with it. The neurocognitive hypothesis suggests that um, there, we, based on our recent memories, uh, we have activation of the brain, of the parietal and temporal lobes, and in the, um, not the visual cortex, the V1 itself, but the outer areas of the occipital lobe. And since those are receiving activation without actual sensory input, but really from internal stimulation, that again, it's based, it's 
influenced by our recent memories and we're really just trying to make sense of and putting together this kind of hallucinatory perception. I am going to briefly go through some sleep disorders. I'm going to stick to the ones that are in the textbook and uh, not go too far beyond that, I don't think. Uh, I did get this yeah, image from this sleephealth.org site if you want to go and maybe look up some um, maintaining healthy sleep kind of uh, suggestions. Uh, I'm going to end. So this is going to spill into Friday because I do have a couple of videos that I like to share. And um, I will end all of this. I don't think I've already gone through any uh, maintaining healthy sleep habits and that kind of uh, thing. So I will, I will end with that to the best of my ability. Uh, I will say, so on this website, sleephealth.org, they have quoted the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention as saying uh, insufficient sleep is a public health epidemic. Uh, and this was that was in 2017. And um, I know as college students, a lot of you have uh, troubles sleeping here and there. So it's it's um, first of all, it's interesting to see what different problems there are out there. If you haven't if you don't already know of some of these that you haven't experienced. But then it's also we'll go through some of the um, healthy habits for for sleeping well at the end. Callet distinguishes between nightmares and night terrors, uh, sometimes called sleep terrors. So nightmares we have probably all experienced. We see it more commonly in children. Uh, we see it through adolescence sometimes and in adults sometimes. It gets more and more rare as we get older, uh, but particularly in people who have some kind of psychological disorder, they're more likely to have nightmares than, than other adults. Nightmares are a symptom of PTSD. So if we have some kind of post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, we can have flashbacks, nightmares, um, things that are, are really influenced by that trauma that we are reliving. Uh, one of the things that has been suggested, and I put it here because I don't know that it's in the later chapter when we talk about anxiety, but they um, help people who have PTSD who are having nightmares. One of the things that helps the nightmares is to learn how to do this lucid dreaming. So. Um, going to bed thinking about the fact that you are dreaming uh, so that you start to become aware in your dreams that you are dreaming. I usually have at least one or two students who have had a lot of experience with this and then a few students who have tried. I worked really hard to uh, do some lucid dreaming when I was younger and every once in a while I can I go back into lucid dreaming but not not like I, I did when I was really, you kind of have to think about it, or at least I do have to think about it. But we distinguished nightmares, which are really more common, and they are occurring during REM sleep. So they are they are those disjointed dreams that are, and then they're just a nightmare. They just turn into um, a lot of really disturbing, uh, it's a really disturbing story that we're having a, a dream about. Night terrors are really different. We see them much more often in children. Uh, it's during non-REM sleep, so actually it looks like the some transition in those deeper stages of, of sleep from stage three to stage four. And usually they wake up and they, they wake up uh, screaming and not able to breathe. They're breathing hard and um, they don't remember things. So usually when we wake up from a nightmare, some of my nightmares from when I was a kid, I could still tell you about. But night terrors, they wake up and if anything's remembered at all. It's really usually just an image. Another dis sleep disorder is sleepwalking. This is something that, again, occurs more, more often when we're children, but it can occur as we get older and especially in adolescence and, and a little bit later as we're, uh, especially when we're very stressed, where these people are sleepwalking and it's during non-REM sleep, so during that slow wave sleep, uh, they are not dreaming they're not acting out a dream or anything they just they get up and they they walk around and as long as they're really not um there's no harm to be done from it unless they start walking out of the house or doing something else driving or something else while they are sleeping which sometimes does happen but sleepwalking itself is not dangerous it's also not dangerous to wake them and to uh, have them go back to bed or to pick them up and just put them get them back in in bed 
Uh, insomnia is another sleep disorder. There are a number, there are different ways that we experience insomnia. And as a college student, you have probably experienced insomnia at some point due to just the stress of what you're going through and worrying about things and thinking too much when you're trying to get to sleep at night or when you wake up in the morning, that there's a lot kind of on your mind. But people with real insomnia, they live with this for more than just uh, some during the stressful times of college. Uh, and so we have people who have onset insomnia who have a phase delay in their circadian rhythms. So it's difficult to get to sleep. They actually have a mutation in their PER3 gene. So I, I actually took out a couple of slides on the PER and TIM proteins and how they influence our circadian rhythms. But um, these people have a mutation in their PER3 gene, and this is correlated with uh, depression. Insomnia is, is correlated with several different psychological disorders, and depression being the, the most um, sort of the most highly correlated with uh, people who have sleep problems and it's not that if you have a sleep problem you're going to have depression it more looks like if you have depression you have a sleep problem at some point in your life so onset insomnia they can't get to sleep it's difficult to get to sleep and they have a phase delay versus maintenance insomnia so these people have what a phase advance in their circadian rhythms so they start to feel really tired at about 7 30 p.m. and they want to go to sleep but they feel like and they know that if they do they're going to wake up at some really early morning hour like 4 30 and so they'll tend to try and push through but they they still tend to wake up um, very very early in the morning when most of us would not want to be awake and they cannot get themselves back to sleep Finally, sleep apnea is a really different kind of sleep disorder in that it is um, about the ability to breathe while you're sleeping. And so these people, they often snore quite a bit and then they'll do this kind of wake up, wake themselves up and have multiple awakenings during the night. They're not getting into slow wave sleep. They're not getting their REM sleep. They're not getting the, the quality sleep that they need. And these multiple awakenings, they're not aware they usually don't remember waking up during the night. Uh, sleep apnea is in, correlated with an increased risk of stroke, heart problems, and other disorders. There is some confound there in that one of the causes of sleep apnea is um, in aging men who are obese, that, that that is correlated with sleep apnea. So I, there's a, a bit of a, there's a lot going on there. However, there are lots of reasons for sleep apnea, and it happens to a lot of different people, and it's based on genetics and hormones and these just these brain mechanisms that help us to breathe. They are deteriorating as we as we age. They just tend to deteriorate over over time. Um, one of the things they have found that helps so sometimes every once in a while they do a surgery but what's much more common is this CPAP so this continuous positive airway pressure where they make sure that the person is getting oxygen and is, is breathing and they're really um, pushing air down into their lungs as they sleep people tend to not like sleeping with this kind of mask and contraption on but the people I know who have used the CPAP appropriately, it, they say it changed their lives, that they, they are getting such a different quality sleep that they, their lives are just so much richer because sleep is, as I've said several times now, sleep is very important. We have just a few more sleep disorders to talk about. I'm just about out of time. And I don't really have time to talk about narcolepsy or REM behavior disorder. And those, I'm going to continue with the direction that things are going. And I'm pretty sure all of this makes sense in this order um, mentally. And I think this is the order in the book. So I'm going, to, I'm going to keep with this. But narcolepsy and REM behavior disorder, I spend a bit more time on. And I want to give myself that time. And I have a couple videos to share. So we will finish this up on Friday.